Uh, welcome. Today we have the second debate in class, and I think this is a very important debate. We're going to be closing what is the idea about GATT, WTO, and the transformation. We have four experts in the area who have been preparing themselves and will be ready to answer some of the ideas and debate among themselves. What should be the whole point of dumping? And so we are going to be taking as our subject right now dumping, and I would like to see whether you have an idea, Ana Maria, what dumping means in terms of what we do in Mexico? It's when another country comes to... Uh, but re remember one important point, I mean, when we're talking about dumping, we're not really dumping about the country. We're talking about what? Who's doing dumping? The, Who? No, the important countries. The not really the country. Who does the dumping? Uh, in the firms, the yeah. companies. So the companies, what is the meaning then of dumping in that sense? Uh, they Produce well, when they make products in a lower cost in order to sell them in the in the export country, in the other country, in lower price. In it, bad because it's going to affect the national production of that country. But it, it is bad to the country where they are dumping, Yamil. You feel that is something terrible that whenever you are dumping into another country, that's bad for that country. Shame on you. Um, no? I believe it's. Well, for consumers, it's good, of course, because they will get like a goods at lower price. But like in the long term, I think it's bad for the economy because um, like some jobs are gonna be lost, mm -hmm. and then um, yeah, like I mean, this is bad because like um, like the firm is abusing of the. I, I believe, like, of the, like, the market of the country. So. so if you are, Mariana, thinking of, carefully, you are a person in a country where dumping is being thrown into, you know, really what you are, you are a consumer in that country, and what the company is doing is dumping products into your economy. Is that really bad for you? Well, for a consumer, I don't think so, but it's a form of distorting the economy because maybe um, it's, like a disloyal competition because maybe there is a point where the producer that is producing the product that it's being dumped uh, will um, will increase the price of the product when there is no competition in the country and then the consumer will have to pay for that product at a higher level so maybe at the long run it is bad for the consumer, but um, um, at the short run, not really. Do you agree with that, Montserrat? Yes, of course, because uh, uh, at the at the long term, at the long at the long term, we we are um, like in a kind of increasing maybe monopolistic practices with just one firm that at the beginning seems to be, um, I mean, like better for the consumer to have a low price product. So what you're all saying is that, in fact, dumping is not necessarily good for an economy, both from the producer's point of view, but, you know, from the producer's point of view, you're talking about the producers in the economy that is getting the products that are being dumped, yeah? Because the, the other country, the other company, is doing what? What, what, is a comp what? what is the incentive for a company to do dumping? To get rid of the national um, firms so they can get rid of all the competition. Like they wouldn't have that much competition because like their prices would be less so they could gain more, um, more market. But, but, but don't you feel that this is kind of counterintuitive? I mean, in a way, what you're saying is that a company is willing to lose money by selling products outside its own economy into another economy. In fact, benefiting the consumers in the other place, but losing money. They will be losing money, so why would they do it? But why would they lose money? Because what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be selling in your country at a lower price than the production price that I have in my own country. So am I, mm -hmm. am I not going to be losing money? Yes. Well, so is this a good strategy for a business? No. What do you think? No? What do you think, Mariana? Well, I think it's some basic principles of economy, right? Um, when um, when a company can make a, an analysis of how much they can produce and um, the price they can sell it, so they can do the dumping, 
but still survive as an economy, as a company, and to reach the point where there is no competition and they can increase that price and thus making like a monopolistic practice. So if you're going to be running a company like that, wouldn't you do that, Ana Maria? Why wouldn't you? I mean, you're going to be working in a company in the future, and uh, you know, this is a nice strategy. Why isn't it? Isn't it good as a strategy? As a strategy to grow as a company? To sell the products at lower price market. In a different market, so you can have some advantages for your own company. What do you want? If, if, if your colleagues are right, and maybe they are, maybe they don't, okay? You have to answer that. Okay? What they are saying is that this is bad because what you're going to be doing is you're going to get into a different country, you're going to be dumping your products, and you're going to be destroying the production in that country. As you do that, you win market. In about three years, five years, they are all bankrupt, and you are the queen of that market. Wouldn't you like that? Is it really that bad? But, well, as a company. As a company, at the beginning, I think it's good, but then when the years come past, it's going to be bad because everyone is going to see you as a bad um, reputation or I don't know, company. Oh, so you are worried about that. Right? <laughs> well, I mean, I, what do you want to know about it? You want to make money or you want to be kind, well, nice? Well, I, I think it's not no. a good strategy because um, if your advantage is on dumping, well, like, what if there, in a, some period of time, there come another um, firm and will do the same thing? So I don't think that's the good advantage. You, you should um, take more, like, um, having low cost or production be more productive, more competitive, effectiveness. I think those strategies are better, are better than dumping. So when you look at yourself as a company, you don't see any benefit in the long run in doing the dumping? No, of course not. Okay. You don't? Neither you? No? Hmm. How are you? I don't think so. No? Unless it's a product that maybe you cannot innovate, the cost can be um, reduced, the processes can be um, better, but I don't think there is a product that can be In the long run, you don't see any benefit? Um, maybe if there is a product that you can improve in any way, but I don't think that's the case of anything. Oh my God. What about the audience? I mean, do they have any feeling about I think Alejandro? I uh, mm -hmm. for a company will be very good, very profitable at the long term since uh, you will be the only one who is going to have 100% of the market share. See, that's the difference between females and males. Look at that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what do you mean by that? I mean, think about the company. So the company really is looking at this as a possibility of growing. Yeah? And you don't mind destroying the rest, even if you are doing that in a way that basically is not competition. Well, I, as you said, I, as, as a company, I haven't said anything. Well, but don't blame me. <laughs> <laughs> as a businessman, I have to look for profits, not for the, 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 the uh, welfare of the people. <laughs> this is shocking. Okay. <laughs> what about uh, the rest of the people? What do they think? Yes. So what you're saying is, yes, let's take advantage of whatever. Okay. Whereas here, our debate team is saying that this is not the right thing to do. Yeah, because maybe another country can be more productive. But remember, this is not countries. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Well, a firm in uh, the same country or another no, country country. can do the same dumping in that con in the country that has been dumped before, and it the new company wins the share of the market of the previous company. Okay, but this is this is a very interesting debate. There, there are three things that we are talking about right here. One is what kind of rules do we have so that we cannot allow these type of problems to happen in the world, in the real world. And so what we're talking about is WTO has a series of rules that will say very clearly why dumping cannot be allowed. That's what we know, that this is really what we're talking about. But what we are saying is, if I am a business enterprise, I may find it profitable to do dumping, because what I'm going to be doing is exactly what you were saying is wrong, which is I'm going to be destroying producers in that country, and once I have done that, I become the queen of the market. 
And if I'm the queen of the market, I'm the only one that has the product. That's really a monopoly process, yeah? Mm -hmm. But you are saying, even from a company point of view, in the long run, that will not be good for the company. That's what you said. If you don't, yeah, if the company doesn't build any other competitive advantages, maybe it is. Uh, maybe it doesn't come. Yes or no? <laughs> then it is. It is bad for the company. Maybe, Professor, it doesn't help um, the firm in a long term to innovate. Like we have seen this um, in several years before. So if I'm the only one, I don't have any in incentive to be um, better or to develop more technology. So uh, I think as a company, as a firm, in the long term, I will not only, well, I might have uh, more profit, but I don't think um, I will be improving my But But look at your career. colleagues in the audience. I mean, you know, look at this instinct, this killing instinct. They really want to go and kill everybody there. Is that right or wrong? From the company standpoint. Not, not from the economy or the consumer, from the company standpoint. Well, it depends on the, the mission and vision of your firm. What do you want? Well, look at them. Look at that vision that they have. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I disagree. You two disagree? Um, yes. Well, because, nice. well, uh, also as we have seen, like a competition makes firms more um, efficient. And I mean, monopoly is like, the worst, I think, because like then consumers won't have as many options as they could, so they wouldn't have like the best products. And I mean, maybe as you say, maybe it's good at first, but it, like what would happen like with the country? Like all of the jobs would be lost, so then like people wouldn't have, I mean, as much is income as they could, so they wouldn't buy uh, as much as your products. That's what I think. So I think it's. Um, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, I, I agree with that. I totally agree. Oh, come on. You're going to change your mind so fast. change your mind. point of view of the country, of the country people, and I'm talking of the other side as a company. Uh, uh, from the company side, it is good, but to the country, it is bad. So if the professor is asking from the company point of view, it is good for the company. I think also it's, it's bad for the firm in a long term because you increase your risk, right? Like what happens if, some, if at some point they put like, um, as we were uh, seeing at <coughs> this slide, an anti-doping anti uh, tariff or uh, A countervailing duty. Yeah, du duty. So your, all your competitiveness, all your uh, 100 market, you're gonna lose that like so quickly. So you're putting a lot of risk But by, but by then, the other companies don't exist anymore. So you can get into that market and be your own market. That's all you have. This is really what they are saying. They're saying, well, look, I mean, this is great for the company. Because what we do is we go into that place. And in a very unfair way, because we are selling below cost in that economy, we have our own market. In our own market, we are making money and profits. And then we use those profits to go into the other people's market. We dump on them. That means we sell at a lower cost. And therefore, they will not be able to compete with me. And I, you know, after I do that, I don't know how long it will take. One year, two years, five years. But the other companies will be bankrupt. When they disappear, because that's their only market, then this market becomes my market. And I can impose prices. This is really their concern. Now, as a company, you're walking there and saying, this is a great strategy. Because I'm going to be making a lot of money later. But I'm financing this strategy, this business strategy, from my own profits in my country, and I go down there and I put my product at lower prices than the cost, and then I'm destroying that economy, which is exactly what China has been accused of doing. Not China itself, but the Chinese companies that will come and will sell at lower than their costs. And look at China today. Isn't that nice? So what? Are we right or wrong? Think about it, this is very interesting, okay? Because if you're thinking about a strategy as a company, then you may end up with this type of strategy, which does not necessarily will be helpful to you in the long run, if you attend to the kind of reasons you were given, Mariana, okay? Which is, let's look at this company in the long run. One of the problems that they may be facing is, because they're making so many profits in a very unfair way in the long run, yes, they make profits, but they may not be able to 
really mobilize resources to do innovation and growth. And so in the long run, maybe, maybe, the company will not be as profitable as it should be. But most people in our countries and in our business look at short-term results. They don't look at the long run. So the point that you're seeing from your colleagues in the audience is they are looking at the short term and saying, well, look, I mean, the short term, I'm going to be sacrificing some profits right now to destroy my competition. That's a good strategy. Well, that's a business strategy that happens in many places. And what you're saying is in the long run is not good, neither for the consumer, nor for the company, nor for the country as a whole. Based upon that, we have this idea of what is dumping, why do firms dump, okay? Why is dumping feared by other companies, which is what you have been answering right now, and then how are we going to be reacting to that? WTO allows me to stop that from happening. So how do I do that, Yamel? Uh, well, there is Article 6 of the GATT, and it says that um, WTO members can collect a certain tax, so by that they can, um, well, protect and stop uh, dumping. But what, what do they have to do in order to do that? I mean, can they just jump and say, I'm going to be doing my anti-dumping, countervailing duty? Or how do they have to proceed? How does the country? This is now the country reacting to a petition from companies in its yeah. country saying, this is not fair. We're being subject to unfair competition from companies from outside. So I'm asking you to go and do what? How do we act? How, what are the rules of WTO for this countervailing duty to happen? They, they have to put the surtax in the boarding of the country in order to get like duties to the, the, firms, the national firms. But this, it's not obligation, it's like an option. I mean, uh, companies can say to the government, do something, but it's not like something that they have to do. They can, but it's not always. What but wouldn't it be fair to do something if you are really realizing as a government that your companies, your private firms, are suffering from unfair competition from outside? So what you're doing here is an exception to what? To what rule that we have in WTO? Uh, what is happening right there? Yeah, but what exactly in that sense? Well, in, in the most favored nation, it's because you are um, being like uh, discriminated as a, as a nation um, in general terms, and as that you can, you are allowed to go to WTO settle uh, well this this dispute, and then well you have two two choices. Uh, you can just wait uh, until the the they, um, s they settle. No, yes. Well, they, they say what would happen, or you can go and have a, like, a con, uh, settle with the other But people. think about what we're talking about. What we're talking about is WTO has enough flexibility that will allow you, under Article 6, to have an exception in this case. And what you will say is the exception means I'm going to be able to put some countervailing duties, some you know, sure tax on imports of this type of product, because I am convinced and I can prove that they are being dumped into my market. And I am not going to allow that. So what Article says does, it allows the country to exercise an exception to the rule, the general rule. And what it does, it says, in this particular case, because you have really shown that there is dumping, you can impose at your border a surtax on these type of products for a period of time that will allow us you know, to control that possibility of your industry being destroyed. So remember, everything happens this way. It is a company that we're talking about. Okay, this is a company business. This is not a country. This is the companies in many countries competing with each other in different markets. As they do that, one of the rules of the game is you cannot look at markets and do dumping in those markets because that's unfair competition to other companies. So it's a company question that we're talking about. And then Article 6 of WTO allows you to go into a countervailing duty, a surtax, so that you can go in against it. The other discussion in this debate, which was good, is what is best for the company? Really to exercise a policy as a strategy, business strategy, 
of dumping or not. And in that, we are pending and we will remain for later class. Thank you very much. So welcome to part two of this debate. Now we have another four people that are <laughs> experts in the area of safeguards. And we'll be discussing safeguards in WTO. So who wants to start? You want to start, Paola? Hmm? No. <laughs> no? Okay, so she starts. Uh, <laughs> so let me, let me ask you a thing. What is a safeguard from your perspective? Uh, it's when you don't, uh, when you don't uh, like follow the rules of the market because you have uh, problems in their country or something that uh, doesn't allow you to follow because you will lose. But how, how you know, Andres, how, how, how is this thing about safeguards? What is the meaning of safeguard? A while ago we were discussing dumping, anti-dumping, and the fact that you can put a suit tax on that. But you know, all of a sudden we have something called safeguards. And it sounds strange. What is the meaning of safeguards? Well, I think it is when the country well, has a, a internal problems of the market and they, they don't know what to do for because they, they already have other contact with our enterprises or the market and they just stop this market or they or they say I, I can allow to to you to provide me so, so so a safeguard for you is a quantitative restriction yes. or, or is uh, a tariff that you will be imposing extra on imports? Well maybe both. Maybe okay. both. Yeah. Maybe maybe it's a very strange term. Well, both <laughs> because mm -hmm. Quantitative, it can be for the product, and if you have internal problems, you can uh, like. So what you, what you are saying is, look, all of a sudden I am in a situation where, for whatever reason, I find it necessary to control how much of this product is coming into my economy. Yes. And as I do that, I take a decision and I say, I'm not going to fulfill my obligations. What obligations you are not going to be fulfilling then? This safeguard is, is really an exception to what obligations? When, when you sign WTO, you sign a series of agreements. One of them said that you could not do what? Uh, the obligations of, of exports of the other market. Yeah, well, article what? Mm -hmm. What is the article that will tell you that this is the things that you'll be doing? Two and 11. Okay. Diana. The, the second article says that you can raise your tariffs, which you said you wouldn't, but because of the uh, because of the raise in the imports, like a dramatic raise, then you, you're able to do that between four to eight years. And also, Article 11 says that you can impose a quota. You can do it both ways. And for developing countries, uh, well, they have a <coughs> special treatment. If they if one represents less than three percent of the market share then uh, it's extent of uh, this measure. <coughs> and also, if the whole developing countries represent less than 9%. So what, you, what you're talking about here is a series of rules and regulations. First, I am obliged by my agreement. I sign an agreement voluntarily as a country that I will not be discriminated against anybody, OK? Mm -hmm. That I will impose MFN you know, concepts. And at the same time, what you're saying is, once I have a series of tariffs, they are binding. What does that mean? I'm oh, sorry, Alejandro. <laughs> well, what uh, does that mean that I have a binding concept in tariffs? Uh, uh, can you give me a synonym of binding? That's what you should be telling me. Now, <coughs> what it means really is, what, what is the sound of bind to you, the word? What does it mean for you? Like getting together or something? Well, that's one way of putting it. But at the same time, what we are talking about right now is there is a limit to what I can do, and I impose myself that as a bind, OK? This is the limit to which I can increase tariffs. Now, once you have reached an agreement WTO, you have two kind of tariffs. Which and which? Uh, quantitative and? No. What about? Valor at, at at Valorem, and the other is a special. Those are tariffs, but what do I have? When I have this, I have binding tariffs, and I have what else? Quotas. No, apply tariffs. Huh? No, those are the kind of tariffs at Valorem or, but 
What I have in terms of my agreement is I define a series of tariffs and I define the limits to those tariffs. That's the maximum amount I can apply. Mm -hmm. But I can apply below that or not? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to have binding tariffs, which is the agreement and the commitment that I made, and I'm going to have applied tariffs. So I may come and say, look, I do agree that the maximum tariff I'm going to be imposing on the imports of cars is 20%, ad valorem or in a different way. But what I also define is but I may voluntarily say I'm going to be applying a 15% tariff. Now, if I apply a 15% tariff, what I'm really applying compared to what I had agreed to apply, if you wish, is a 5% difference, five points of difference, okay? These are applied tariffs. These are the ones I am really applying. And the other one are the ones that I have an agreement as a commitment not to go over, and that's 20. Those are the two different kinds of definitions. Now, once I have done that, if all of a sudden I find a surge in imports, because I decided to put 15% and all of a sudden, wow, I have all this amount of cars and it's beginning to create a problem inside my economy. What do I do then? <coughs> well, like I say, when, when, you, like, when you have a... You're going to apply safeguards. What does that mean in that way? How am I going to do that? Because what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be creating a problem. And the problem is, according to Article 19, okay, okay. I'm going to be allowing what? A temporary what? A temporary restriction. Yeah? Yes. Diana just said that. So what is a temporary restriction? A temporary restriction is says to the other country to wait because I because I have to, no, to wait no. What are you gonna be doing with temporary restriction? Alejandro. Mm? Well a temporary restriction means like a countermeasure in order to try to protect your your just, just think about the definition, temporary. What does that mean? Well, for, for a certain period of time. Okay. I so think it is temporary is for a certain period of time. No yeah? more than eight years, I believe. That's when you are allowed to impose your temporary uh, safeguards. And is that good or bad? It's good because you protect your, your domestic market. And you can, in, with all that time, you can also improve uh, your balance of payments and all that. And if you don't uh, put that uh, time, period of time, the imports you have will, uh, instead of benefiting you, will uh, provide a, a disadvantage. Okay, so Diane, you're a company, you have a strategy, and you're looking at this thing, and all of a sudden you find out, oh my God, you know, these guys lower the tariffs, and by doing that, I'm being inundated with the products that are competing with me. What will be your reaction immediately? Well, I, I wouldn't like that as a company, as a domestic company. And then what would you do? I would probably go and complain. To whom? <laughs> to the government of my country. Okay, so we have to understand these things over and over and over again, okay? One of the things that's going to happen is you're going to be working in companies. You're not going to be company. Well, maybe you're going to work in consumer groups. If you like that, that's a different story. But if you are working for a company, and all of a sudden you have your government agreeing to a certain binding of tariffs that will be lowering tariffs, and you see that you have a lot of the products that you are producing being brought from outside. What would you say immediately to your government? Wouldn't you do that very quickly? I mean, come on, I will be rushing to see my authority and say, hey guys, give me a break. Yes. And then what the break means is, we are going to be flooded with these imports, and therefore let's impose safeguards. Can you do just like that? No. What, can, what, ha, what do you have to do? Well, you have to justify uh, your, your situation. It's not just like that. I think it, the safeguards are a good thing because when, when countries don't want to agree upon tariffs, upon new rules, you say, OK, don't worry. We could just agree on it. And if you have trouble, then you can do the safeguard for you know, a period of time so that your industry, your domestic industry can get used to that, can get, you know, better, and then they can compete. So I think it's a good thing, but not all the time because that's just protectionism. So what I define then as WTO is I'm going to allow you, if you really justify it, by three or four different ways. The first one that we are talking is 
On the other hand, I have this surge on imports, okay? That's what we're talking about right now. But you also could say, look, I'm having trouble with balance of payments at this point in time. I'm facing a difficulty in really financing the excess of imports over exports that I have in my economy. And so you can walk with the IMF, which nobody likes in this place, okay? But you go to the IMF and you say, look, I'm having serious trouble in terms of my economy. I need time to adjust. And I need help from the IMF, support for balance of payments. But I can demonstrate then that my balance of payment situation is complex for different reasons. And I need a temporary restriction so I can, in a way, recover my stability as an economy. Now, this is different from talking about a company coming and saying, I need help because I'm being flooded with imports. This is a different argument. This argument is the country has balance of payments problems, and because of that, I'm going to be imposing temporarily safeguards to certain imports so I can reduce my deficit. If you're going to be doing that, you better be pretty much in agreement with the IMF. This was the concept that we managed before. You need to have different organizations participating in this definition, OK? But I'm going to be doing it because of balance of payments. Am I going to be allowed to do it because of balance of payments reasons? Yes. Am I? If your balance of payments are, are really bad, you, you, and you demonstrated that you, you have a problem, yeah, you, you can do it. OK, so WTO is allowing me several ways through which I can make an exception to the general rules. Yeah? As a company, I can be asking for that protection. As a country, I can present my position as balance of payments. And what else can I do? What is the other argument that I'm going to be using for the safeguard? Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe if, if you perceive that you are the sector-specific safeguard, right there. infant yeah. industry, well, maybe if, if you have a, a, a lot of companies that are just being born and you need like to, to provide them with certain uh, protectionism until they grow and they can be by themselves, maybe that, that's what infant industry means, that you are allowed then to do that. And so what we are talking about is, despite what many people talk and say about WTO being inflexible, imposing rules, forcing countries to do certain things, what we keep looking and seeing again and again and again in these exercises is there is a lot of flexibility. I can impose rules, but I can also impose exceptions to those rules. Now, this is an exception of the rules based on three different things, yeah? Now, does it make sense for the country <coughs> to go into an infant industry argument? Actually, what I, what I saw in, the, in this article is like, is a, a lot of, uh, of rules, but also you can, you can like turn the rules and in your position and allow to you to be prepared for, I don't know, for certain circumstances, circumstances, and you can be, I don't know, I be, I, I can check out a lot of rules and, and the rule says something, but our rules say you can do this if you have this problem, and. This is what is so when, when you're looking at this while you're talking uh, what article 19 yeah yeah and article 19 what it says is I'm going to be allowing you temporary restrictions now Diana does it really make sense to use the infant argument industry as an exception as you know to really bring and say well look I mean I need to develop my industry so I'm a country that has no possibilities well I think that if you your industry is not already developed in that sector maybe it's for a reason, if, you, if there's a, s a special circumstance where you need that industry in your country for political reasons, okay, that, w that would be it. But okay. if L let me use that thing. Now, you don't think about the, poli you know, don't, don't think as a politician right now, think about the business person, okay? Mm -hmm. And what you're realizing right now is this is politically motivated. Are you gonna get your money and your investment into that industry? Mm -hmm. In the infant industry? Yeah. No. Why not? Well, because I trust the big, the big guys, not the ones that are just, you know, learning how to walk with somebody's help. So you wouldn't do it? Like, if I was a business yeah, person? Yeah, you are going to be a business person. That's uh -huh. what I'm asking you. I hope you're not going to be a politician. I hope you're no. going to be a business person. <laughs> so if you're going to be a business person, you're on the other side, and, you, and you're looking at this argument, the government comes and says, I need to protect my industry because I want to make 
certain industry appear. Infant industry argument. Politically motivated. Sounds good. You're going to put your money there? Mm, no. no? Well, if I really firm my contract and I say to, to the country, well, are you going to gonna stop my market? I'm going to say, well, you're gonna, you have to pay me. I don't know. Maybe I'm going to charge with some tax or charge it. I don't know. So some, some price because I'm, I'm a losing market because I, I really firm a, a contract with you. I say I'm going to export. 150 tables, and you say, oh, give me a break, I, I need... Yeah, but think about this. You are, you are in the country. Here you are in a country. <coughs> what, what's that, nice? did, that didn't have this market before. All of a sudden, a company comes from outside and creates demand in your market for, let's say, uh, watches, okay? Okay. And all of a sudden, this becomes a profitable business because people are buying watches. They yeah. love to have watches. Whereas before they didn't care about time, now they care about they time. About time. <laughs> and so they are now <laughs> buying watches. As they are buying watches, okay. you are looking at this situation. Okay. And as a government, you say, guess what? We can establish a development policy by creating an industry called watchmaking, which already has a market. So I'm going to be substituting imports. Okay? And what I do is I go to WTO and I say, Article 19 allows me temporary restrictions. Okay? And one of the reasons why it allows me temporary restrictions is because of the infant industry argument. So I walk into this relationship and I say, look, it is important that I allow my industry, my watchmaking industry, to become competitive. So I'm going to be creating this temporary restriction either through quantitative restrictions or, you know, tariffs or what have you, for a period of up to eight years. So I'm going to use my eight years. That I can do as a country. Now think about it, you as an investor in your country who is going to be making money investing in different aspects. Will you invest in the watchmaking industry or you wouldn't? Of course, because I have eight years of plaza and I can in these edges like put my 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 market in these edges and the people know my market and when the other country ha when have to so you expect people to have loyalty to your brand in eight years no loyalty but, but maybe uh, I can I can gain I don't know uh, a really percent of the market and uh -huh. when the other other competitors come to my country the people know my market, know my, my Your company, brand? my mm -hmm. brand, and maybe it's going to be a plus for my, for my company, and maybe I, I should invest in the watch. So you want to invest in that. What about you, Orlando? Well, I, I totally would, since, uh, as you said, the market is already established, and therefore com a government is going to provide me with certain protectionism, so it would be very, very easier for me as a company to start uh, making profits. So, and as, as he said, I think that eight years is a decent amount of time. So you will, you will gain loyalty from your clients. And uh, after the eight years uh, period ended, competition will arrive, but you will already have your market uh, already established. So I, I, I would. What about you? Also, I would. Yeah? If, if I have the oh protection if, no. oh, of the government, why wouldn't I? So I gain market. I don't have uh, that much competition, so it's better. What about you? What are you thinking? It depends on the industry. Because if, uh, Let's talk watchmaking, watch, okay? Watchmaking, no, because in eight years, if you're a Mexican, you're not going to be against the Swiss? Swiss guys. But if it's, I don't know, like maybe uh, alternative for green energy, where the world is, like, everybody's kind of new that industry, so I would think about it. Yeah, but you, the Swiss has got his market, and you had your market. Maybe the Swiss is a high-class market, and you have a, a low-class market. In Mexico, you can do a, no, a low price watches, and this is a profit. And the Swiss can be a high market with a high expectation and, and higher prices, and this is a market. You're not competed with, with her, with, with the, this company. The low prices watches you have a lot of uh, 
uh, competition already. Yeah, oh. but maybe yours is better than a nice than <laughs> others. So there was another, <laughs> another hand over there raised uh, in the audience? No? No? Okay, think about this. Okay, here we go again. What we're talking about is WTO allowing you flexibility to protect your economy when you find difficulty for different reasons. Two of the reasons that we're talking about is I didn't expect it to have that amount of imports coming into my country. So I'm going to be giving some protection while my industry adapts. The second one is I have a serious balance of payments trouble, and I need to resolve that. And the third one is infant industry. But look at the discussion that we just had in infant industry. This is terrible. See, this is the way that you make the wrong decisions in an economy, because what you are doing is you are creating an artificial market, and what you're doing through the protectionist process is making people believe that they will be competitive when in fact the possibility of being competitive may or may not exist. So you make your investment and you know you have protection for eight years. If you are a serious investor thinking about this, your plan has to be, I'm going to be making my investment right now, I'm going to have protection for eight years, and I better get my returns in eight years. Because after the eight years, the probability that you still have very little competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis the people that really have it in the rest of the world may be small. So if you are a business person and you are thinking a strategy, one of the things that you have to be very careful about is if I invest in this industry because it is protected, I better be conscious of two things. Either I'm making an investment for eight years, returns on that, and then I'm going to be facing serious competition without any possibility of other things, or protection, or I am convinced that I'm in a sector where I will be able to make the necessary adjustments, innovations, etc., to be competitive when the protection disappears. Mm -hmm. So what happened with that market? You, you just give it to the, to the forest? No, all I'm saying to you is you are a business person. You have to be very careful in your decision-making process. When you make investments, you have to calculate very clearly why is it that the market is attractive. If the market is attractive because you are getting protectionism for a period of eight years, you better make up very clear in your investment process that either you are very competitive at international standards eight years later, or that you better get your money back and all the returns you're expecting from your money in eight years. Because once the protection ends, you are going to be facing the cold, war of competition. It's like a, a six years of government. Yes. And so you have to make up your decisions correctly. But what WTO allows you is to impose the safeguards under Article 19. Okay? Okay. Thank you very much. Good debate. Mm -hmm. so, welcome back. Now we're going on the third part of this debate. This is becoming quite interesting because what we're looking at more and more is the concept of how should you be doing your investment process if you are an enterprise. The whole point of this exercise is not only to learn about what WTO will do or not do, but rather how will I react as a business person facing all these different movements that I have. Unless you start thinking like that, it's going to be very complicated for all of you, okay? Once you get there, and there means when you start working. When you start working, you start to look at this environment. This is the environment under which you are going to be investing. And so it's important that you think about it in that concept. So we're going to be talking now about what I call general exceptions. And this is my favorite because, I don't know. Let's start with uh, Mauricio. What, what is the meaning of general exceptions? I mean, what is this thing? You know, we're talking about how difficult WTO is imposing all these conditions. And then all of a sudden, we're finding out, my god, you give exceptions almost for anything. Well, it is because it, it barriers uh, for a lot of sectors. For example, you have uh, the PPMs, the production process uh, measures that yeah. enables almost to all sectors because all sectors have different procedures and that affect the environment. And also you have uh, the Article 20, which says that uh, in order to the country to uh, obtain or reach to certain objectives, you can, uh, policies, objectives, they, uh, they can have certain exceptions. For example, if 
the product is to, in moral conflict with the society, they can put a um, kind of a tariff in order to they, the product doesn't come into the country. What about that, Jocelyn? I mean, all of a sudden, we're talking about morals here. What is this concept? Yeah, I think that... <laughs> does it have any economic sense? I mean, come on. Yes, uh, yes, I think that it has sense because a general exception, I suppose that involves the whole countries that are in the GATT or now in the WTO. And it makes sense because uh, it allows the competitiveness around other countries. But probably it could be not like so fair. But moral concepts? What's a moral concept here? What's he doing? What's he doing here? Yeah, uh, but I think that they are just looking for the interest. Morality, so all dresses have to be two meters long. No, I think that... You're going to show your legs, come on. No, I think that they can... Is that a moral sense or not? No, it's... Yeah, it's... No, it's not a moral sense, no? I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that they are more... They have a moral well, sense because... Do you think it's a moral sense, you know? Um, I'm going to tell you whether you can wear or not shorts. No, <laughs> no I don't think so. I don't know. I, mean, I don't know what moral sense is. Um, what, about, what about the women in this audience? Am I going to forbid dresses that are below <laughs> or above the knee? Is that a moral sense or not? No, it's more like you just. Uh, it's more like your rule. Yeah, but I'm going to impose this a rule. Yeah, but it's your perception. Probably yeah, the other yeah. thing that. Oscar. Yeah, it is personal, but a, a country can can say can 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 say um, the the women cannot use shorts. So even if it's personal, but you live in that country, so you must. So we're entering an area which is very complicated because if I'm really using what's called the, the public morality, then then it becomes complicated, yeah? Yeah, it's yeah. very complicated. Then that's why they they uh, in the article twenty there's the the chapeau. Um, that's the good faith. So so that that so that, that says you see, you see here we are again. Faith. I mean, are we talking faith or are we talking something very <laughs> Yeah, I'm talking about morals. Uh, it says that but you're saying you have to the justify. The Chapeau concept of Article 20 yes. says that I'm assuming that there is a good faith. Yes. Mm -hmm. What kind yeah. of faith? Is this Christian or? No, I mean, <laughs> that, I mean that you have to justify that that those rules are, I don't know, because are made uh, have a uh, a cause, not not just saying like that that women can cannot use shorts because but I, let's suppose I just that you decided have this, this public morality that women. In my country, have to have these long dresses all the way to the floor, okay? And then the company says, fine, no problem. I will be producing dresses. I will send them to this country all the dresses that I have a length of at least 2.5 meters, so they will be really, you know, going all the way. If you do that, that's fine. And then I'm going to say, wait, wait, wait. But this company is making dresses that they are selling in Mexico, which are above the knee. And that goes against my morals. I cannot allow and support that kind of product and that kind of company. So even though it's fulfilling the rules in my country, because it is doing differently in other country, I'm going to say that this is affecting my public morality. Mm. Is that fine? Uh. Um, do you mean uh, I'm as a producer? You are the producer. You are selling products in my country, okay? Uh -huh. I, I impose this concept that in my country, because of public morality and the morality that we have, I cannot sell. anything that you sell in terms of dresses for women will have to have the following characteristics, mm -hmm. A, B, C, D, okay? And then you say, fine, I will fulfill that. I will send the product to your country, which will have exactly what you're talking about. So I'm going to be respecting this morality concept that you have in your country. But... I am Zara, yeah? And I sell dresses in 150 different nations. So what I do in your country is I will fulfill your concepts of morality. But if I'm selling in Mexico, I will go there and I will sell dresses which are above the knee. And then I say, ah, you see? That company is not fulfilling the concept of public morality that I have as the way that people should behave. And therefore, I will not allow their product to get into my country. Is that fine? No. Why? I think that's a kind of protectionism 
uh, of the country. But I'm not doing for protection. I'm really serious about this concept of morality. Um, I do believe in these things. Okay, like in a religious country. Um, well, I hope everybody is religious, but I mean, from the standpoint, <laughs> of it, I am applying a rule as a country. Is okay. that correct or is that incorrect? Uh, do do yeah, you perceive it as a protectionist? Uh, well, you can tell if uh, one thing is mm, mm, good or bad uh, because it depends on the perspective. So it's like uh, it's it's bad because uh, for one country may it may be good or not like so important uh, the dresses uh, to be like too short, but maybe in Mexico it is so. It's bad because it uh, uh, reduces the market and also the accessibility to the people for, uh, like, well, people here in Mexico can go to the United States and buy uh, the short dresses they want. So that's, I don't think that's But never. I will not allow you to, to wear them. That's a different story, yeah? It's what you will do inside is very different to what okay. a company can do. Mm -hmm. Now, think about it this way. And I'm going to ask the audience there, you know, Mariana over there, I'm going to ask her. If you're looking at this situation of morality, it becomes strange and then you start discussing whether it makes sense or not and whether it will be translated as protectionism. But let's think about the environment, Mariana. What about the environment? Well, it depends uh, the way the producers or the, the company that's doing this respect the rules. Because in the, uh, in the last example that you said, I think it goes more in a discrimination way. Because if the country is, uh, if, the, if the company is respecting your, uh, your, uh, the way of, if, the way of thinking of your country, I think this is more kind of discrimination. And uh, talking about like environment, environmental, if the company is also respecting these like uh, rules. Let's think about this famous discussion of fair trade and free trade. You know, all of a sudden you have these people saying you should not buy coffee which is not grown in organic way. And therefore, I'm going to impose in that as a concept. Nothing to do with morality. Now I'm talking about a different perception. Organic is good. It's good for the environment. No more pesticides. Well, I also think this is more like a more personal issue. Or maybe it depends if the governments are like more paternalistic. Because they impose like a, uh, so, some ideas to the, well, to the people. Like you should buy these, you should uh, buy national products. So I think it's also the way of... Uh, I'm not discussing national products. All I'm saying is this company uses pesticides to produce coffee. Pesticides are bad for the environment, and therefore we should not allow products from those companies to get into my country. I think it also goes to, you know, like in a protectionism and discrimination way. And maybe it's just like your concept, or maybe you just uh, want to like love those, those cells, because it's not what you think. But Jose, how do, you, how do you match then this concept of Article 20 that will allow me okay, to use different elements? They allow me public morals, they allow me health of plants, health of animals, health of people, and they will allow me also you know, natural resources as the excuse, or if you want, as the justification rather than excuse, the justification to really impose some exceptions in what products can I allow to come to my country. How do you match? This concept, you know, that, that's what this is my favorite slide, because what it means is something called general exceptions. And, and you know, I keep listening to people telling me all the time, WTO is so bad, WTO imposed so many rules, WTO is really trying to create this. And all of a sudden I find out, my God, these guys give exceptions to everything. I, mean, I can mm -hmm. use morality, I can use uh, natural resources, I can use health, and impose restrictions on trade. How do you match that with this open free trade, fair trade, the reality of what we're talking about? I think well, in every aspect of the well, health and, and environment and everything, there will always be like, ups and downs. And not every company will be able to, to ensure the complement of like, every step of the legal process or every specific every specific attachment to the law in, in regarding every sector in, in each country that the company wants to enter. 
So if there were no exceptions to the rules, I think every company would be in trouble in every country for different kind of, I don't know, different. In some countries there will be problems for the environment, in some countries there will be problems for, I don't know, dumping or it could be anything. So the exceptions, I think, gives the company some breath and some air for putting things together and make them work in a proper way without being like without having so much pressure in but then what we are doing is protectionism what about it uh, well, because he's talking about let's give him some breathing space oh, yeah. I mean, give me a break mean, I mean you know it will be protectionist um, no I don't know are you sure or not yeah I'm sure because okay. you will distort the market by creating uh, well by taking in uh, the exceptions of the Article 20, you can create uh, market distortion, as you say, you can apply to the moral public or to the health care, and you can bring that stuff into a protectionist way. And that's, I think that's what Oscar meant it with the uh, fate of the country. Oh, let because me go back then to Oscar. What about good faith? What is the meaning of good faith in the end? Well, it's really hard to... So, um, so you go, you go to some to person and, 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 and you say, well, look, I mean, I really think that you are asking me for money in good faith. What is the meaning of that? Well, that the justification of, like, he has the causes and justifications to believe that he needs the money for. for so that he's really telling you the truth. Yes. Yeah. But now, talking about trade, it's really hard to... to um, what about lending money? It. Lending money to people is easy. I mean, you know. No, no, no. But well, when we talk about trade and Let's rules, and I come to you and I say, look, I mean, Oscar, I really need money right now because my mother is sick. Mm -hmm. My father really has to undergo surgery. Please lend me three hundred thousand pesos, and I will give them back to you in two years' time because I need you know, all that time. I don't know. I do you believe me or not? <laughs> I, you don't believe me. I would check if, if you're <laughs> So if, if you check, yes. then you're not taking me on good faith, yeah? Yeah, but they got um, this, this, uh, these rules, and they told you to... By the way, in my case, you'll be right, because my father and mother have died a long time ago, so that's fine. Okay, I, I would check if, if something okay. is wrong from, from, this, from the beginning, then okay. I will not so believe the you. The point that we're making is, yes, we will provide you with exceptions, and yes, I'm taking in good faith that you are telling me the truth. Nevertheless, I would like to do some checking. Yeah? Mm -hmm. How do you do the checking? What the, for example, with the, the, at the end of the year, you can check in, which you, in what you spend or in what you are investing off. And in that case, you can How check. How do you do the checking in this concept of morality? Um, that concept of morality. I think that it's really difficult to check the morality in, the, in one country because not all the persons believe in the, in the morality of your country. Because with the globalization, a lot of th thoughts uh, came around in the world. So I think it's really difficult to check the morality in one country or in one nation. What do we do in WTO to make sure that, take away all these concepts because they are very difficult to discuss. But how do you do, Nancy? How do you do about this? Fulfilling the rule that I need to check or verify. What is exactly that I cannot do if I impose this kind um, of things? Well, you can uh, look for the jurisprudence um, and check the cases that has uh, happened before and what uh, you have to do now to uh, get better. So okay. So jurisprudence is a nice word, but how do you put it to work? Um, Checking each each situation okay. because each situation can be different with the other. So if you put your jurisprudence in that case, in that case you can uh, put one solution or one check-in in one thing and other that it could be so similar, but your jurisprudence says it's going to be different in that way. So you can check in different ways. Andres. You can check with general standards. 
Okay. And you put a inner standards in some products, and they, they pass. You say, well, I will, I will accept you your product. Okay. I believe in you. Now, uh, that's it. Maybe standards, like an example of the cars. They give you the electric. Put some standards that that you you wanna you as a country want to uh, the market enter to. But Mariana, one thing that you don't do is you don't say to these guys, look, I don't mind, I am going to take in good faith, according to this Chapeau concept, that what we are doing is right. But what is not right is if I take a company which is selling products in other country where they don't have these concerns, use that as an excuse for not allowing this company to send the product which will fulfill your concern in your country. Isn't that true? Is this what happens? You, you can do that. So the country cannot do this discrimination, or can they? No, but according to the rules, according to the rules of WTO, can they do that? No. Why? Why would you say that they cannot do it? Why, why is it right that they can't do it? Because you, uh, well, um, for example, like the well, this is such a rules like the Chapeau, it's like established, so you, do, um, you should like uh, um, follow these rules in, in order to have the... If I'm taking you in good faith, what I'm saying is, I believe that in your country you may take it this way. But if you are started telling me that a company that fulfills all the rules in your country and then does it differently in a different country, because of that you are going to be avoiding their product to get into your economy, what is really that you are saying? What are you really thinking about at that point? Well, that you don't want to um, follow this. That you are just like convenient way. And you are doing therefore what protection is measured. And, and, and then the concept of public morality, health mm -hmm. reasons, natural resource reasons do have a limit, okay? Because otherwise what I will end up with will be a world where everything is controlled. Yeah? Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. Do you have any, how will you react as a company if all of a sudden they have these public morality issues that allow you to compete in your own economy? Will you be happy or will you be concerned? That allows me as a... You are a company in Mexico and I'm going to impose in a condition that because dresses have to be this long, no one can sell here, and because they have to have this kind of fibers, they cannot get unless they have those fibers. And this, everything that you have in Mexico, will you be happy with that? Well, I think it will be good because it will make me more competitive, it will give me It really will make you more competitive. What well, will it make you? In, in my market, yes, because I will have less competition. So ah, in fact, but not more, more competitive. What it will give you is an unfair advantage. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you, they can do that because you have the national principle that implies that you have to treat your nationals as your foreign company, so it wouldn't happen. But I think that's a, the as a company working in Mexico or producing in Mexico, it would be good because I would have a certain time of an advantage because of having less competition in, in my market, so I could win more market share in that time. And all of a sudden, an atheist gets to government and says, all this nonsense about public morals doesn't make sense. Let's go, everybody can put it in. What happens to you? Yeah, it, it will be, I, as I say, it will be good, but only for a time. So you, if you have that uh, protection measure in, in bulk, you have to be uh, sure that you are not going to follow, to have all your business follow that strategy. You only have to look at it as uh, an advantage of that time. So you, do, you wouldn't put your business strategy, business procedure, um, depending on that, on that norm. So if they take the, that norm or that policy, you will still be competitive because you will only see it as an advantage of that time. So, Oscar, what have we learned in all these discussions and debates? If you are a company, what would be the risks to you as a company to define your business strategy and investment strategy on many of these exceptions? Well, it, it is hard to make a, a long-term strategy because of, uh, of this kind of exceptions. 
because you don't know when when they're gonna apply to some uh, morality morality uh, issues or some health issues that you didn't have uh, prior to to when they said it. So um, it is hard to to make this kind of a strategy. Well. Think about it. This is exactly what we're talking about, okay? When you make decisions as an investor, you have to understand what is the environment that is surrounding you. You need clear rules, because otherwise your decision-making process will be affected by those rules that are now defining your environment. So one of the things that WTO will give you will, will be a series of clear rules, but at the same time it will give you a series of exceptions to those rules. And those exceptions to the rules are covered all over the place. And what it will give you, really, is a concept which is fundamental to a company. Be careful if those rules, which will be the best process of making decisions, are now being tampered with because of exceptions. Because the exceptions will give you a breathing period, but that will end given the fact that even in the exceptions, there are rules. And therefore, if a country does not fulfill those rules for the exception, the exceptions either will disappear when you go into not really a dispute, yes, a dispute settlement, or will disappear because they have a temporality imposed. Okay? Be very careful when you are in business because this is exactly what you will be facing in the world environment. Learn about WTO, what it means, what the exceptions mean, how these things are being conditioned so that you understand when can they be changed and change around what you are making as a decision. You had a final question? Yeah. Well, another question is, I don't think we should be afraid of the exceptions because even though the WTO says that any country can do the have a decision of having an exception, if the other one uh, has a complaint about it, then they will do an necessity test and they will evaluate the market. So maybe it will take time, but it's, it's, you're better off even though it takes a while with the WTO having exceptions that are not happening. And also, remember, these things that you have full control and you will be doing everything and therefore you're going to impose rules, it's not true. You have a lot of possibilities as a country, as a company, to defend yourself and change the process and the environment, even within the rules of WTO. Thank you very much. It has been a great discussion.